in the book of Ephesians, there's, there's two places where Paul prays. And we know that when Paul is praying, he is praying for those people in that time, but he's also praying for us. He's praying for all believers for all times. And so uh, we're going to end the service probably with that. I think we will have plenty of time to get there. And, um, but I want us to just, I want us to have a time of prayer right now. So those of you who don't know, we have a cross back there in the corner and we have prayer warriors who kind of watch that cross. So if at any point during the service, if you have a spiritual need, a physical need, that you just need somebody to pray with you. If you just want to go back there, there's anointing oil there. And uh, um, we would love for you to go back there and uh, someone will come join you. Um, but I want us to just pray right now. So... If you are here this morning, and, and I just have my head, head bowed and eyes closed, I, you can do the same or not. But if you're here this morning and you need some type of physical healing, you need some type of, you need, you need God in a, in, a, in a way that only God can do, then I just pray that you just raise your hand. Or if it's for somebody in your immediate family, that you do that. So God, I'm, I'm not looking because I'm not the one who brings miracle. I'm not the one who brings healing. I'm not the one who brings any of that. It's you. And we pray right now in the name of Jesus, that, is, that name that is above every name, um, by whose stripes we are healed, by whose death on the cross we are, we are raised to newness in life. We pray in the name of Jesus that every hand that is raised and every need that is represented, that you would touch it as only you can. And there is nothing impossible for you. There's nothing that is beyond your ability. There's nothing beyond your reach. And there's no one here that is beyond your care. So I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would do the work that only you can do. And that, God, you would be glorified and lifted up by the way that you meet our needs beyond what we can think or ask or imagine. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. So here we are. We're in, uh, we're in Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, years ago, I came up with this little idea about kind of, I like to talk, I like to talk in parables, not to be, you know, not, not to be biblical or anything like that. But I, I always find that a story helps, helps, you know, make a, make a point better than anything. And, uh, I came up with this idea years and years and years ago, and it's about, um, imagine that you work for a family owned restaurant and it's not a chain. It's a family owned restaurant. You work for a family owned restaurant. You are, you, you're a server there. You, you get paid to, to be there. You get paid to wait on tables. You get paid to, 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 you know, to fulfill orders. Sometimes you might be the one who sits people down. You, you might end up being the one who cleans up the table. You might even do dishes or, or once in a while, but basically you're just an employee of that family owned restaurant. Okay. And so who do you work for? Well, you work for the owner of the restaurant, but who do you serve? Well, well, that's a little bit different because you serve every person who comes in to that restaurant. You serve them. You serve the grumpy ones. You serve the happy ones. You serve the ones who are good tippers. You serve the ones who are not so good tippers. You know, they'll leave a, a Bible track or something. But yeah, don't, don't ever do that. But so many times we get confused about who we work for. I work for the, for, I work for the person I'm serving. We serve those people because of the person we work for and we work for the Lord. Why is that important? Well, because in this chapter, the very first thing that Paul's going to say is I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I'm not a prisoner of Rome. I'm not a prisoner of the religious officials of, of Israel. I'm a prisoner of Christ. He counted everything as unto the Lord. He, he never worked for somebody other than the Lord even though he, he had different jobs and, and, you know, we know that he was a tent maker and, and those other things. So when we talk about the fruit of the spirit and this tied in with like a devotion that I had this morning, um, the fruit of the spirit and the gifts of the spirit are not the same thing. The fruit of the spirit is, is one thing that has a bunch of different um, categories, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It starts with love. And if you, if you're good at loving, you find the rest of those kind of are way easier to do. 
And so we have these gifts that God has given each of us. And then there's the fruit of the spirit that, that shows through because we're connecting with the Holy Spirit. When we, when we start with that and we lead with love and we serve with love, it becomes a lot easier to do the things that God's called us to do. And so we know that Paul absolutely loved the people. Notice something Paul wrote, and this, this is in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says this, Let the word of Christ dwell, richly, dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. So I, I just want to encourage you, if you're struggling with, there's somebody in your life you're having to serve, there's somebody in your life you're having to deal with, there's a situation, there's a job you're having to do that you're really struggling with. Instead of thinking about, oh man, I just can't stand this job. Begin to look at it from a different perspective. God, why do you, what, what am I doing for you today in that thing that I really don't like? What am I doing today in that thing that's not necessarily easily? Because I've decided I'm not gonna work for that person who I'll never make happy. I'm gonna work for you, the one who's given me every good and perfect gift. So Paul did everything in that way. So this should apply to whatever, whatever's going on in our life. So here we are, Ephesians chapter three, verses one through three. For this reason, okay, that should make you go, for what reason? For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to, be my, uh, to, to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. Paul is, Paul is saying, I'm, I'm a prisoner of Christ. But he said, for this reason. So we have to go back. What reason? This goes back to chapter two. We looked at it last week. And, and I'll summarize. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, so built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. For that reason... I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard the stewardship of God's grace that was given to, you, uh, given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. We talked about this last week. We are, we are based on the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. That cornerstone will not be moved. There, there is nothing that can shake the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're implanted on that. We're, we're standing on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ, right? That's, that's really good, to, good news because we'll never, we, we see other people and their life is not built on the foundation of Jesus Christ as a cornerstone. And we know eventually they will crumble because the foundation they're on is not, is not secure, it is not sturdy. So this is what Paul is saying. And we know Paul, you know, he was the Jew of Jews, right? And, uh, and so he, he it's, it's, right now it's his ministry, it's his mission to reach out to the Gentiles. We talked last week about, it's not about Jesus as uh, coming, coming to faith in Christ isn't about Gentiles becoming Jewish or Jewish people becoming Gentiles. It's about Jew and Gentiles becoming followers of Jesus Christ. We become Christians. We, beca we, we, we don't have, we, nobody has to go to the other side. You know, um, my, my, I've told you this before, uh, marriage counseling, you know, the two shall become one. And they argue for the next 30 years over which one they're going to become. No, no, it's not you're going to become you and I'm going to be. It's we are going to become somebody totally different together, a blend, a mixture. And so that's what, that's what he's talking about for this reason. You're no longer outcast. There should no longer be this animosity. There should no longer be this, this uh, conflict between you. Um, Sister Rose isn't here today. Rose called me this week, and, and uh, if you don't know Rose, she's, she's such, a, such a lovely person. And she called me and uh, she goes, now, now, now Brother Mike, 
you said something Sunday I need to ask you about. Okay, first of all, everybody has the total freedom to do that, right? <laughs> because I, I love it. Because of course I'm, I'm, you know me, I'm bracing myself. What did I do wrong? But 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 she said, you know, there, there was a, there was something I said, and it, it it bordered on politics. My point was not that you should be a Republican or you should be Democrat. My point was that in the body of Christ, politics should not divide us because we're all drawn to the word. So eventually we're all gonna have the same opinion because we're drawn to the word. And so I clarified that with her and I told her, uh, I, I told her who I was voting for and it was, it's fine, it's all gonna be good. <laughs> but, but, but that's what, what my point was, was not about that. My point was about that when we're in the body of Christ, I'm glad that not every person in here is just like me. I'm glad that, that some of you have skills I don't have. That's the reason I went to Kevin and, and, and Zale and I said, you guys are the ones who are gonna tell us to leave because I don't, I, that's not my thing. I, I'm, I'm no good at that. I don't wanna be good at that. So we need each other. And once we have that for this reason, Paul, Paul is going on with, 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 with what we're supposed to be doing, what we're called to do, and that is to build the kingdom. Now, he uses the word mystery. How many of y'all love a good mystery? Okay, but see, what we think about when we think about mur mystery, we think murder mystery. Uh, we, we think, uh, you know, my, my kids love to play Nancy Drew games where there's a mystery that you must unravel and you got to do all the different things. Or, or it's usually like a negative thing. It's like, do you know, it's, but that's not what mystery is here. Mystery here means something that is hidden until it's revealed. But guess what? Even once it's revealed, it's still a mystery. See, we say mystery solved. What Paul is saying is, no, no, the mystery is always there. But we've had revelation, so now we understand the mystery. And the mystery is, how, how, how did God, why did God choose to save us, choose to redeem us, choose to make a way where there was no way. That's, I, that's beyond me, how anybody, how God would do that, but that's the mystery. But see, for our, our lost friends, it's a mystery that's still hidden. But for us, it's a mystery that's been revealed, but it's still a mystery. Anybody here know why God chose you? Okay, if you, if you can give me five good reasons. <laughs> he, he, it's, it's a mystery. But it's a mystery that's been revealed to us. So this is, this is like, you know, uh, they, somebody used the example of, uh, you know, you've, you hide an Easter egg and then you go find the, somebody, somebody tells you where that Easter egg is so you can go and get it. It's, it's, that's a bad example, but we'll go. F four and five, <laughs> I know. Verse four and five, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of man in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the spirit. What do we know about the Holy Spirit? We know that in the Old Testament, before, before the Acts chapter two, before the day of Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit came, the Holy Spirit would come and visit and then would leave. He, the Holy Spirit was on Saul and then he was removed. He removed himself from Saul and he attached himself to David. The Holy Spirit can always just, God can be everywhere. The Holy Spirit could have been on more than one person at a time, but he wasn't on every person at every time. You and I, we have the benefit of, we have the Holy Spirit 24 seven. Now here's where we have to be careful. Why don't I feel the Holy Spirit 24 seven? It's not him. It's me. It's it's me. I'm the reason. I'm the reason I'm not hearing from him. We were we when in, in our uh, hour of darkness last night, Sally. We found uh, we found our weather radio, you know, and we turned it on, and it's like there was no noise. I was like, oh no, oh, maybe everybody's dead, and, and I don't know. And then I walked over and I realized she turned it on. The volume. She turned the volume way down. See, sometimes I turn the volume way down. Um, I have a dream I'm going to share with you guys in a minute, but, um, but anyways, so, so past times, but now with the, with the coming of Christ, with, with salvation, and now the, the not, no longer the, the, um, the visitation, but the indwelling, the, 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 the staying in us, we have the Holy Spirit. Verse six, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. The Old Testament hinted at this, that 
that God was going to bring all nations, but but he but they had a hard time. Wait, so if we're if we're the favored, if we're the chosen people, and they are the chosen people, then how do these other people get in? But it's always been there. But now it's it's undeniable. Paul is saying what what Christ has done is makes it undeniable that it's not just now for the Jew; it is also for the Gentile. And most of us in this room, that's us. And aren't you glad that we're we're invited in? Verse seven. <coughs> Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. The two words, working and power. Uh, Working, it's energy, power. It's the word we get dynamite from. If we have the Holy Spirit in us, we should be people of energy and power. Now, We can be laid back, that's fine, but you're still a laid back person who is full of energy and power. We are full of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is full of energy and power. And I think that's one of the reasons early in my Christian life, I was convinced I would not like Paul because Paul seemed to me to be a person who was a little too full of energy and power. But we're all supposed to be filled with energy and power. That's how we do the thing that we're called to do. Uh, what should we look like if we are called by a spirit of energy and power? We should look energetic and powerful, not anemic, not lazy, but energy and power. Verse 8 through 10. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages of God who created all things so that through the church, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Paul says, I'm, he, I'm humble. I'm humbly proclaiming the best news there ever was. It's like, I, I'm modestly going to say, I have the greatest thing ever. I mean, do you, do you see kind of the, I mean, because he knew it wasn't about him. He was what? He was the Jew of Jews. He was, you know, he was the cream of the crop. He was the best of the best. And yet he labeled himself as the least of all but I got the best news of everybody. And that is that Gentiles now are going to be part and that the church is going to have the manifold wisdom of God and is going to make that known in heavenly places. Preach the unsearchable riches of Jesus. Bring to light everyone the mystery from the God of all creation so that the church would make known to rulers and authorities God. That's pretty good. That is, that's a pretty good assignment. Verse 11 and 12. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Boldness. Now, there's a couple of y'all in here. I know you're bold. But did you know we're all supposed to be bold? We all can afford to be bold. What is boldness? Boldness means I have the freedom to speak the truth. I can boldly speak the truth because it's not my truth. It is the truth. I have boldness because this is the truth. How do you know it's the truth? Because it's what the word of God says. How do you know it's the word of God? Through faith, I believe that this is the word of God. And because I believe it's the word of God, I believe it to be true. And so I speak with boldness that this is the word of God. The problem is, is that it's, it's so easy for us to get talked out of the belief that God really did inspire the word. So boldness, confidence, confident access. I, we just don't fully, we just don't fully get it. I, I can kind of get it though. Um, when uh, I, I meant to do this earlier, how many of y'all are related to twins? Every hand in here should go up. <laughs> Uh, we, we were hoping that Grace would bring the twins today. And, and we realized that in this group of people, we were going to have six sets of twins in this room. Now, we only, got a, we only got a half of those, but I mean, we have three sets of identical twins in this church. 
There's something in the water, I'm just saying. <laughs> but here's how I know, here, here's how I understand a little bit about total access. When my grandkids are in this building, did you know that my grandkids are pretty sure they can go anywhere in this building at any time for any reason and do whatever they want to do? You know why? Because they can pretty much go anywhere they want to go at any time and do whatever. They, I mean, it's amazing. They come to our house and, and they know we have full access here. That's the way you and I are with the God of all creation. We have full access to him. We have total access. Um, how many of y'all have ever gotten a backstage pass at the Ryman? It's pretty cool. You know what? <laughs> that don't mean you can go everywhere you want to go. You, you don't have all access. You just have limited access. But what we have in Christ is total access, confident access. So we have boldness in what we can say, and we have confidence in the fact that we, we have an open invitation to the throne room of heaven. And even better than that, we have the holy presence of God in dwelling in us. That is really, really good news. Verse 13, so I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Um, th there are people who are suffering all over the world because specifically because they're Christians. I, I saw just, uh, just yesterday, uh, there's a couple, uh, Davy and Natalie Lloyd, they are, they're, they were minist uh, missionaries in Haiti. They were, they were killed by some of the local uh, bad guys. And right now they're trying to figure out how to get their bodies back home to the U.S. And, and it's a very complicated thing. And so we, we think, well, that's kind of an extreme. It's not really an extreme. It's happening all over the world. It isn't happening in the United States yet, but, but, but it is, but it's happening. But how many of y'all suffer every day because of your stance for Christ? In some way, we, we have people coming against us. We have, we, we, we have to suffer for those, for those people who will tell you, well, if you're in Christ, you never suffer. I don't think they've read the whole new Testament because it's, it's all, it's all part of suffering is just part of the process, but we suffer with bold confidence and total access to the throne room of God. So even though we are suffering, we are suffering here in a temporary thing for something that is permanent and completely immovable. Every person in this room has sacrificed for somebody in your life. You've, you've worked extra hours. You, you've, uh, you've, you've brought in somebody into your family who you, you, it was a sacrifice. Every person in this room, there are people in your life who you constantly sacrifice for. And I applaud you in that. That's, that's part of it. Is it, is it, doesn't it make sense then that if we're going to sacrifice for a human that lives in our house, wouldn't we sacrifice for the God of all creation? I mean, he, well, he doesn't want us to sacrifice, Mike. He did away with the law. He, he, Christ died so that, that, so that that's finished. On his part, it is finished. But we still, we want to live a sacrificial way. We want to say, God, where do you want to send me? I always pick on, you know, going to Millersville as the worst thing. It's worse than going to, it's worse than going to Africa. <laughs> whatever it is God wants you to sacrifice, whatever sacrifice God wants for you, is it too much knowing that you have boldness and confidence and total access? So this is where we get to that second prayer. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to read this whole thing and then we're going to kind of go back and, and, and break it down. So the prayer is from verse 14 through verse 19. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Lord, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Anybody want that prayer prayed over them? That, 
I can't think of anything he left out. I mean, there's uh, his riches, not my riches, his riches, not the riches of the world, his riches, not the richest man in the world, his riches, which are beyond anything, um, that Christ may dwell in our hearts, that we are going to be rooted and grounded in love. Have you ever tried to pull up that one thing and it's like, man, this root is deep. Just cut it off and we'll, de we'll deal with it again. We're rooted so, and guess what? It's not, we're, we're rooted to him. He's rooted to us. He's the one holding on. We're not holding on. So, so that's to me, the strength to comprehend. Why would it need, why would we need strength to comprehend something? Because it is so big. It's so big. You got to have strength to carry, the, you, to comprehend the love of God. You got to be strong to carry that. You know, I mean, it's, and, and what does he say? He says the breadth, the length, the height, the depth. That's every, that's every part of it. We, we get to carry all of that to understand that. The surpassed knowledge that you will be filled to the fullness of God. Now we see where verse seven, where his dynamic energy comes from, because Paul gets this. Because Paul understands this, that's the reason he has dynamic energy. Why wouldn't you? Look, I'm walking around all day and I got everything that he just prayed for me to have. I, I can be bold. I can be dynamic. I can be energetic. Verse 20 and 21 says this, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen. His closing was an acknowledgement of God's power, God's presence and God's knowledge. We serve a God who is all power, is all present, and has all knowledge. It sounds like the, the cards are stacked in our favor. I mean, he has all power, and he's all places, and he has all knowledge. What's, what's left to worry about? Well, he might not have enough power. No, he has all power. Well, he might not be everywhere I'm at. He's all places. Well, he might not know this situation. He has all knowledge. There, there's no loopholes there for Satan to enter in and go, well, you know, he doesn't have this and he doesn't have that. No, he has all power, all presence, and all knowledge. I want to tell you about a dream I had. Um, <clears throat> uh, I've been praying for you guys and for myself that we would have more dreams and visions because the Bible says as we get closer and closer to Christ's return, we're gonna have dreams and visions. So I'm just thinking, well, if I pray for dreams and visions, doesn't that hurry Christ up? I don't think it actually works that way. But I, but I do know that, that we wanna be a people who are completely aware. And if the Holy Spirit is in us and he's talking to us, then, then you know, dreams and visions are kind of a normal thing. And so the dream and vision, the, the dream that I had, and I don't always dream, but Sally said I was like really, very restless. Um, first of all, Julia made me pressure wash the entire driveway yesterday with her help. I was wore out by the time we got to bed. I don't know how I had enough energy to dream, but I had a dream. I don't remember a lot about the dream, but I do remember the dream was either in two parts or the dream had, or it was two different dreams. And even though the dreams were not the same within the dream, two different people said to me the same exact thing, get your kitchen in order, get your kitchen in order. And I woke up thinking, that sounds kind of important. So then um, as I'm doing my quiet time this morning, as I'm praying through it, I just, I, I, first of all, for those of you who don't know, I think you are the best person to interpret your dream because 
what kitchen means to you may not be what kitchen means to me. And, and God speaks to us in a way that we can understand. And while it's really important to go and, and look up things and go to people who help dream, dream interpretations, most of the time you already know the interpretation if you'll just let yourself admit it. But, but I'm sitting there thinking, what do I think about the kitchen? To me, kitchen is where the meals are. That's where the meals are prepared. The kitchen is where you eat. That is where you get nourishment. So when he's saying, get your kitchen in order, it's, it's not like I'm, there's something I'm doing wrong. It's, it's that he's saying, are you making sure that you're being nourished? Are you making sure that you're eating the right things, that you're in the right place in your spiritual nourishment? Are you, are you sure about that? So I, I did look it up on the internet. Um, a longing for connection and a need to feel grounded is one of the interpretations that they, they give. The dreams need, uh, the, the dreamers need for emotional and spiritual nourishment. Okay, so that's, that's kind of what the, the internet says is a, is a description for that. But how I walked away from it is, what, what do I eat most of the time for my spirit? Well, you know, I'm, because, uh, you know, I'm a professional. I'm supposed to read my Bible every day. I do that, okay? I, I prepare for these messages, I, and I try to do stuff beyond that. But just to be honest about you and about me, if we, if we, were, to, if we were to count the time that we spend in the Word and in the Lord as our meat, and the time that we spend on Facebook as our desserts, how many diabetics... <laughs> I'm, I just was really convinc convicted about this. It's like, okay, so I have all this good, nutritious nourishment available to me, but in my own mind, I'm like, but I much prefer this stuff over here. So I just say this as a, as a way of encouragement for all of us. If you're struggling to feel the presence and power of the, if the, if the Holy Spirit, if things that we can't even think or imagine are available to us, but we're not seeing them, could it be that we've become malnourished spiritually where we're not spending the time nourishing ourselves in the things of the Lord? We're, we're, we're really very full of the other stuff and there's, there's nothing wrong with that in balance, but I think you get my point. So um, here's Paul's second prayer. And uh, I just want to pray this over us. And then we're going to do, we're going to have a time of fellowship, prayer and fellowship, because I'm done. And, uh, you know, something doesn't have to be eternal to be immortal. <laughs> so, um, I want to pray this over you, and I pray, I pray that you'd receive this. And then we're just going to, if you need prayer, we'll be back at the cross. Otherwise, don't rush the kids, because Jeremy and Brian and not Nadine and, and oh, uh, n let me pray, and then, sorry. Paul's second prayer. If you would let me pray this over you, would you stand and just uh, receive this? So Holy Spirit, I just ask that this prayer, the prayer that Paul prayed over the people of Ephesus, and by extension, he prays, he prays it over us, and we believe that prayer is an eternal thing, that it is still bouncing around the throne room of heaven, and we want to echo that this morning with this prayer, and Holy Spirit, I pray that you would minister to us in this prayer. I pray that Christ dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you understand being rooted and grounded in the love of God. I pray that you will comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height 
and the depth of his love for you. I pray that you experientially know the love of Christ as it surpasses theological knowledge. I pray this to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. And to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Holy Spirit, we thank you. We pray that every day our minds will become a little more aware and a little more aware and a little more aware of how much you have done for us, how intimate you want our relationship to be, how, how much joy you find in being in our presence and how much joy there is to find in being in your presence. And we know that there are so many things going on in our world. There are so many people uh, struggling right now to, 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 to stay in the faith because the enemy is loud and consistent. But God, we are confident in whose we are. We are confident in your power, all power. We are confident in your presence, all presence. We are confident in your knowledge, all knowledge. We want to rest in that and we want to serve out of that. We pray, Father God, that you would bless us. Holy Spirit, you bless us as we go into a time of fellowship. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So as you're getting ready to do some fellowship, you'll notice outside where there's some cake.